to see you. Uh, it's the last time you'll see this shirt on me. My wife, uh, you know, she buys me nice stuff and tries to get me to dress up, and I never do it, so I leave it hanging in the cl closet. And this morning I thought, oh man, I better do it, you know. So I did it, and it's like 6:15 in the morning, she goes, Oh, you're wearing this shirt. Again. So, I, so I have it, and then my son comes up to me, and he says, uh, "Hey, nice disco shirt." That's why I don't wear those kind of things. So, take a good look. You won't see the shirt anymore, ever again. I pacified my wife, and I'm not going to be subject to any more ridicule from you or Sean or the devil. So. How many of you are contending for a breakthrough this year? Now, wait, stop, wait, 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 wait. You know, hold it. Sometimes you ask questions in church and there's this automatic thing, you know? The answer to every question is, Jesus! Or, you know, how many of you, yeah! You know, but I want you to just think about it just for a moment. How many of you really are, in your heart, contending for a breakthrough this year? I mean, really? Would you, okay, would you stand up right now, real quick? I'm going to practice what I preach. I'm not in a hurry. So, I'm going to pray for you because you matter. And all the pain that you've gone through, and the addictions, and the hardships, and the disappointments, and the, in your mind, unanswered prayer. Notice I said in your mind. Um, I, I just want you to know, we care about you. God cares about you. And there's a number of people in here that care about you. Care about your marriage, care about your finances, care about, care about your heart, compare, you know, really care about you physically and emotionally. And so, Father, right now in the name of Jesus, people are just standing up here and they're saying they need a breakthrough. And we pray for them, we contend for them, God. I pray that as we look around and see people that are standing up, we pray that you would imprint these faces on our hearts and our minds, that you would prompt us in the future, this year to pray and contend for breakthrough. Whatever it is, God, spiritually, physically, emotionally, relationally, maritally, financially, in every area, you are the Jesus who is the King and Lord over all. And we pray that anything and everything that's going on in anybody's life in here would be subject, submissive, and yield to the Spirit of the living God. And so we contend for breakthrough in every area. And every person that's standing up here right now in the name of Jesus and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Now you've got a hand clap. That's good. Well, we are in a series called Reset. Uh, we are, a lot of us are going through a book called The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry. This is a great book. I want to encourage you to pick it up somewhere. We're not selling it, but go online and pick it up. It's Really, man, it's, it's about redefining, recommissioning, resetting um, spiritual disciplines. And I know sometimes spiritual disciplines have a bad connotation in people's hearts and minds. They're thinking another form of legalism. Uh, I can assure you it's not that. Um, so we're talking about reset, finding peace in the age of anxiety. I want to talk to you about something called simplicity. Everybody say simplicity. Simplicity. And here's the verse I want us to go to. And I want us to look at this verse, and I want us to read it out loud. And I want, it, I want us to read it emphatically, okay? Not like um, some kids that have to say something out loud in a class. Uh, but these are Jesus' words. Even though they're not in red, these are Jesus' words. And I want you to read it with me out loud. Ready? Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled, and do not be afraid. One more time. Go. I leave you. My peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled, and do not be afraid. Amen. <laughs> you were a little faster over here. So it's cute. <laughs> um, Jesus said that. You know, when he talks about peace, when Jesus said this, it's in reference to his desire to give them the Holy Spirit. When he talks about peace, he is talking about not just the cessation from war, but the well-being and tranquility that accompanies that. Now, peace isn't a concept. A lot of times we go through life and we hear these concepts, you know, gratitude, 
you know, these are biblical words, but the world kind of hijacks them and, you know, thinks about it as an add-on to our life, to enhance our life. But peace is in the person of Jesus Christ. It's not a concept. It's a person. Jesus is the Prince of Peace. Therefore, the peace that he has, he gives. He's the one that gives it to us. We all need it. Have you looked around and seen how much trouble the world's in? You know, I, I, I love statistics. How many of you love statistics? I love stats. I had two pages of stats. And quite frankly, when I read them, I thought, this will either bore them or will scare the hell out of them. Because all around the world, you see terrorism, famine, you see problems, you see nations against nations, you see dictators, you see you know, bombs going off, airliners getting shot down, missiles, embassies getting assaged, you know, all this stuff, you know, and you think, my gosh, we know, that's stating the obvious. Is there anybody in here that thinks the planet is in a peaceful state right now? No, it's in a state of unrest. The answer is not another peace talk, it's in the person of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. In the 3,500 years of recorded history, the planet has only known 8% peace of the time. 8%. In fact, in recorded history, there have been over 8,000 peace treaties that have been signed and over 8,000 peace treaties that have been broken. So when you watch the news and you see a couple of leaders getting together signing a peace treaty, know this, it's a great intention, but it'll never be followed through. Because I believe the only person that can give peace is Jesus. And until leaders come to the table and really get a hold of who Jesus is, I don't think we're going to see world peace. That doesn't mean you don't sit at the table. It doesn't mean that you don't negotiate. It doesn't mean that you don't sign the peace treaties. But the best of human effort will be a failed intention. I'm going to stick with Jesus. And not just 2020. I'm going to stick with Jesus the rest of my life because I know he's the only one that has the authority and the personhood to give me peace. Now, when we talk about simplicity, you know, I think about Paul's words in 1 Corinthians. And this is just a great verse. And that's not the verse 2-2. Two, two. It's 11-3. Um, yeah, that's the one. That's a good one. Here's what Paul said. But I fear lest somehow as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, so your minds may be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ Jesus. Everybody say simplicity in Christ Jesus. I will tell you what. When I look at church history, something is very apparent. That when man gets a hold of God, we try to do things to complicate the lives of believers. You know, Jesus is very simple. God the Father, God the Son, the Holy Spirit, the Trinity. Very simple, really. Jesus Christ as Savior, as Healer, as Baptizer in the Holy Spirit, as soon coming King. Very simple. You must be born again. Simple. But what man does when he gets a hold of God is he complicates. Now I want you to just think about this. I was reading this this morning in Acts chapter 15. You have Gentiles, non-Jewish people, coming to faith in Jesus Christ. They've heard the gospel. They've heard the good news. That acknowledge before God that you're a sinner. That you need to get right with God. Accept God's propitiation or substitute. The one that's in place of your sin. And accept Him by faith. And come to Him. And you'll be saved. You'll be set free. And that's a great gospel. That's good news. And you don't need to do a lot to complicate that. And so they found out that some of these Gentiles were coming to faith in Jesus. And their lives were new. Brand new. They were born again. We're like, we got Jesus. We have new life in Jesus. Our hearts are free. Our minds are clear. We have a purpose. This is great. We're living for Jesus. And religious people came along. Yeah. I'm telling you, when religious people come around, you've got to be very careful. I mean, go homework. Read the book of Galatians. It's only five, six chapters. Five or six chapters. Five or six chapters, okay? It's all about, it's all about Judaizers. Everybody say Judaizers. It's about all these people that would see Gentiles and would say, you've got to obey the law. And Paul would have strong language for them. Who has bewitched you? Who has seduced you to believe another gospel? How is it you were saved? Was it by the works of the law and legalism? Or was it by the gift of faith? 
you would just go on and on. And so you have these religious complicators. Life in Christ is very simple. Religion complicates it. Rules, obligations, duty, legalism, dogmas, complicated. And so you have these Gentiles that come to Jesus and their life is brand new and it's absolutely awesome. And religious people hear about it and they say, whoa, whoa, whoa. Wait a minute. You don't get to just believe in Jesus and have a new life. you got to do some other things. you got to be circumcised. I will tell you, as a grown man, that is not good news. <laughs> I got Jesus. Yeah, but you need to get circumcised. Oh, yeah. How about I work in children's church once a month? No, twice a month. Are you kidding me? And that's what they said. They said, you have to be taught by Moses and you can't be saved unless you're circumcised. And so this dispute breaks out. And they said it again. Now you've got to be circumcised. You, you've got to obey all the law of Moses. Let me tell you something. The Bible's very clear. Christ, say it with me. Christ, Christ is, is the, the end, end of the, the law. law. He's the end of the law. He's the fulfillment of the law. And scripture says the law frustrates grace. And those of us that walk in grace, I will tell you, religion is not close behind that wants to frustrate that. And seduce you into thinking that you can do something to add to the free gift of salvation. And it's garbage. There's nothing you can do. Anything you think you can do diminishes the work of Jesus on the cross. You're going to add to that? Really? What are you going to add to that? You're going to add your good works? Jesus died, but I'm going to do some good works. I'm going to be a good boy. I'm going to be a good girl. I'm going to give up a couple coffees and put it in the offering bucket. And God's going to go, now you're getting it. No. You and I got nothing except what Jesus did on the cross, period, exclamation point. That's it. And then, so they, they said, so they have to say, okay, you know what? God doesn't make any distinction. He gives the Holy Spirit to the Gentiles, just as he did to us, that by faith, have their hearts purified by Jesus. And so they say, okay, well, we're going to go, we're going to go have a council. Because religious people like meetings. So they have meetings. And they have councils. That's what religious people do. They, they, they love meetings. And they love boards. And they love to vote on things. I'm telling you, religious people like to do this. And so they go to they go to Antioch and they go to Jerusalem. You know, these are the mega, mega churches, mega synagogues, big, big places, apostles, big people there. And so we're gonna take it to them. We're gonna come back and we're gonna have a decision. So they go. And you know what they say? Why should we not why should we make it difficult for the Gentiles returning to God? Why do, you make, why do you want to make it hard? These people renounce their idolatry, denounce their paganism, renounce their hedonism, heathenism, they accepted Jesus, and now you, you want to make it hard for them, and, and you, want to, you want to yoke them. That's the word it used. Now just keep that word, file it away for about three minutes, okay? You want them to wear a yoke of legalism, a yoke of bondage. That's what you want to do to them? And, and here is their conclusion. You know, it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us not to burden you with anything beyond the following requirements. Oh, what are these requirements? Is it going to be scrolls and scrolls and scrolls and pages and pages that need interpretation and commentary? Well, let's see what they are. It says, okay. Abstain from food sacrificed to idols. Okay. Abstain from blood, from the meat of strangled animals. Okay, no roadkill. All right. <laughs> Number two. Flee sexual immorality. That's pretty simple. You get married. 
husband and wife, live together in union for the rest of your life. And if you do well to avoid these things, you know what he says? Farewell. You know what he would say today? He's signed. <laughs> that's what he would do. That's what he said. That's it. You're going, okay, there's got to be more. No, that's it. It's the simple gospel. Stay away from these bad things that will corrupt your heart, your body, your mind, and soul. There's only three of them. Just stay away from those. And follow Jesus who you receive by faith. The rest of your life, you got a good life. Now, how many of you think that's pretty simple? I think it's pretty simple. I think it's absolutely life-giving, and it's a great reminder of me when I try to help somebody who comes to faith in Christ, you know, by not yoking them with a bunch of stuff. A bunch of requirements. Well, you should do this, and you should do this, and you better do it. My gosh, do you think yeah. Jesus and the Spirit of God are capable to lead people? Yeah. To speak to people? Yeah. To teach people? Yeah. I don't know if we really believe that, but you know, I'm thinking, I didn't know where the verse was last, last service, and I was, I was hoping it was a verse. And if it wasn't, I was, you know, maybe it should be a verse. But it was, it was, you don't have any need that a man teach you. But you have an anointing from the Holy One and you know all things. Follow him. Yes. And so I had Alex. Yeah. Alec, you know, I said, could you look that up? See if it's a verse. So he's in his phone. And then Ken Burst goes, First John, chapter 2, verse 27. <laughs> Thank you, Ken. Didn't miss a beat because he knows the word. Simplicity. Now, how do we complicate? Here's, here's two ways that we complicate the simple life that's in Jesus. How many of you long for a simple life? An uncomplicated life? Especially with Jesus. Here's two ways we complicate the simple life in Christ. Number one, hurry. We hurry. We rush. I'm going to blame it on Thomas Edison. Late 1800s, he gets a bright idea. Bright idea. He goes, we're going to make light bulbs. Incandescent light bulbs. And so he makes the light bulb. How many of you think light's a good thing? Light's a good thing. I like light. But here's the problem. You and I were created by God to, don't miss this, it's really complicated, to work during the day and sleep at night. <laughs> That's how we were created. But Thomas Ed comes along and goes, oh man, we're going to keep him up all night. <laughs> he did. And, and here's what he said. He said, everything which decreases the sum total of a man's sleep increases the sum total of man's capabilities. Oh, wow. Now, he may have thought that that was pretty cute, <laughs> but there's a death sentence in that. I mean, he said, he predicted a future of sleeplessness. I'd say he predicted pretty well. He said that night became optional. He said sleep was a bad habit. Now let me just tell you right now. Sleeplessness prolonged will make you crazy. That's the truth. You don't sleep, and usually it's about three days. Studies show after three days, I mean, non, I'm talking non-stop, no sleep. You will eventually hallucinate. It will have the same, you can Google these studies yourself. It will have the sleeplessness has the same effect as hallucinogenic drugs. So once again, all this, whoa, my gosh, what happened over there? Are you okay? Wow, you're chilling? It doesn't sound like chilling to me. It sounds like you're amped up about something. And after the service, you can apologize and tell me what you're all excited about. So, I mean, once again, think about, think about how we fast forward our lives, you know? It's not even Thanksgiving, and all of a sudden all the decorations come out. And then somebody has the nerve to hang Christmas lights before Thanksgiving. I don't know who you are. You know what my biggest temptation was? My biggest temptation, when I saw lights going before Thanksgiving, I thought, I think I might just go rip those down. I did, I'm not even joking. There was somebody in our neighborhood, I thought, okay, count the cost, Bob. Arrest, humiliation, Roseville patch. Oh my gosh. This, okay, scrap it. But the whole point is we get so ready for the next thing and the new thing and Christmas. The, the bird, you know, the bird is in the refrigerator and then it's Black Friday and people are running out to go crazy to buy stuff. 
And then Christmas comes. Christmas isn't even here. Christmas barely turns the corner. And I'm in Safeway. And you know what a whole aisle is devoted to just after Christmas? Valentine's Day. In December. It's wrong. And I saw that. I just went, oh, man, I am going to go Jesus in the marketplace right now. It's wrong. And you know what I thought? I said, do you really think... The average aloof guy is going to go, oh, they've got it now. I'm going to be two months early. No doghouse. No. Because I walk by that same aisle for the next three, four weeks. And you know what? Not one product has moved. You know what it's called? Here's the word for it. The clinical word is hurry sickness. Hurry sickness. It's defined as a behavior pattern characterized by continual rushing and anxiousness. An overwhelming and continual sense of urgency. Jesus said, follow me. Think about how he lived his life. He walked, they say, an average of 20 miles a day. You know, he never ran. I don't think, correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think there's one instance where Jesus ran. Why? Because the Son of God is not in a hurry. He's not rushing. He's walking. What are you doing? <laughs> what am I doing? He, he wasn't running around. Now here's the thing about being conformed to the culture of hurry. You'll get applauded for it. People will clap for you. Go, Johnny, go. Go, Sally, go. They will. That pace that we're addicted to. And if we can't keep up that pace, we'll slam down a five energy drink. Five hour energy. Gotta go faster. Jesus is having none of it. In fact, you know what Jesus is doing is his rhythm? I think it's Mark 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, or 6. It's in there. It's in the New Testament. It's in the Bible. It's somewhere between Genesis and Revelation. It's in there. Here's what it says. Jesus got up while it was still dark. You haven't met Thomas Edison yet. But it was before dark. Jesus got up and he went to a deserted place. And there he prayed. And the culture, the disciples, found him. And here's what they said. Jesus! Everybody is looking for you! Which, that's a good thing, right? We want people to be looking for Jesus. But they were frenetic. They were exasperated. They were intense. They were trying to yoke their hurry, sickness, on Jesus. Let me tell you, Jesus is having none of that cultural stuff. Because he's not in a hurry. God is not in a hurry. God set the rhythm and the pace of love, and it's walking. It's not running. It's not a to-do list. Oh, i got to do this. And you know what Jesus said after they all just, they got him and they were freaking out on him? Jesus said, let's go to the other side. i got to preach over there too. Come on. Let Jesus set the rhythm in your life. Don't get caught up in a hurry sickness. What's the answer? You know, and here's the deal. It's so easy to get into. How many of you by, would say by nature, oh, maybe she didn't ask me that anymore. I'm not raising my hand on that one. How many of you would say you tend to run internally in the hurry mode? I'll be the first to go. Let's start a support group. <laughs> I'm in a hurry. It's Bob. I'm in a hurry. <laughs> I was coming back from Pakistan. I was in hell. No, London Heathrow Airport. That's right. <laughs> Insane place. And I had a connecting flight that I had to catch. And I'm watching the TSA people taking everything out of every person's bag in front of me. And the line is way up there. And I'm doing this, and I'm doing this. I'm not a you know, math whiz, but I'm thinking, okay, that's in gate 9,000. I'm at gate three. They're taking everything out. It's like, this guy in front of me goes, hey, you want the connecting flight to Sacramento or to Chicago? I said, yeah. He goes, we're going to miss it. 
And all of a sudden, I'm getting amped up. I'm like, oh, good. We get up there. He gets his stuff. He takes off running. He's fucking this big guy. Sweat, man. He's got his bag. He's running. What do I do? I get my stuff. I take off running. Ah, I'm catching the guy sweating. And then it hits me. You know what hits me? Do I really care about missing a flight? Do I look like the type of guy that cares about missing a flight? I don't care about missing a flight. At all. I've stayed 15 hours in airports. I've spent nights in airports. If I have coffee, food, electronic devices, I'm good, it's a vacation. But I find myself like, oh, oh God, man, man. I'm thinking, stop. You don't care. That's right, I don't. I went, I just walked. Had my backpack, just walked. Then I started hoping I'd miss it. Show the man. Get there, I'm the last one on the plane. There's nobody. They're waiting for me. I don't pick up the pace. She's going. I'm like, good to see. You. How's your day going? Yeah, so this plane's leaving. There's no problem. I walk home. There's everybody looking at you. And they're amped up. It's like, myself from hurry. I suggest you do the same. Unyoke. It's a choice. One, two, three, four, five. Okay. For five of you, it's a choice. Antidote. Matthew 28. 11, 28. Gosh. Ready? Come to me. All who labor. Labor. Worn out. Tired. Exhausted. Jesus. Come to me. If you're heavy laden, literally you're loaded with spiritual anxiety. In part because of keeping rules and regulations you can't keep, or because of an over-conscientiousness of sin. That's what it's talking about right there. When you're preoccupied with your sin and not his salvation, you will get worn out. When you're preoccupied with all the things that you should do for God, as opposed to enjoying the grace of God, you will be worn out. Worn out. I'll give you rest. Jesus said, I'll give you rest. Literally, literally, I will give you the feeling that when you stop moving, like when you work out or when you're running, and you know how it gets hard and you get sweaty, and then you stop, and you know that... He says, that's what he's going to give you. That's the rest he's talking about. I'm going to give you rest for your souls. He said, learn of me. My yoke's easy. My burden's light. Notice he says, come to me. I mentioned this a year ago. Come to me. He didn't say, come to religion. He said, come to me. He didn't say, come to a podcast. He said, come to me. He didn't say, come to a seminar. He said, come to me. He didn't say come to your favorite preacher, your favorite commentary. He said come to me. He didn't say go get a good book. Good books are good. Compared to who Jesus is and the words that he has and the life that he has, most all of it is junk food. Now put down this great book. Buy it. I don't get any commission, but buy it. It's a good book. But he didn't say go to a book. He said come to me. He didn't say come to a meme. He didn't say come to your resolution list. He said come to me. Don't, don't revisit your goals. I'll get more energy when I look at my goals. No. He didn't say that. He said come to me. Jesus said that. Yeah, goals are good. Have a goals. Make a million goals. I hope you... Like, fulfill them. Great. No, seriously. Good. 350 goals. Nailed it. Beautiful. But come to him. Failed him. <laughs> it's only been me for the last 60 years. <laughs> yeah, he didn't say go to a person. He didn't say go get some self-help. Self-help book. 
self-help book. Really? He didn't say get another shot of espresso. He didn't say get a motivational speech. No. He said, come to me. Can I get transparent with you? This has been one of the hardest disciplines in 38 years of walking with Jesus. Coming to him. Because I like to be active. I do. I like to listen to podcasts. I like little memes. Be your best Bob now. Yeah. If I was going to get a tattoo, I'd probably get that. Best Bob now. You know what I'm saying? It's just easy to get sucked in all this stuff. Come to me. Sit at my feet. Second one, busyness. Busy. Luke 10, 38. Happened as they went. Entered a certain village, a certain... You've never heard this story before. This is new. I know that these pages are stuck in your Bible together. That's why I'm telling you that. And a certain woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. She had a sister called Mary who also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. She sat at his feet. Now this is interesting. The rabbis didn't let women sit at their feet. Just didn't. It's just unthinkable. Women could, from a distance, listen to teaching, but never would a woman sit at the feet of a rabbi. Rabbis, when they read scriptures, they were always standing up when they read scriptures. But when they were teaching, lecturing, expounding, commentating on the scriptures, they always sat down. So here's Mary seated, seated at the feet of Jesus. You have Jesus just sitting down, and she hears his words written in the continual language, so she listened and kept on listening at his feet. The living word. She's present. She's all in. She's undivided. Her attention and gaze is there. Her preoccupation is with Jesus. She heard the word for herself. And once again, I'll tell on myself again. I have looked for spiritual shortcuts in my life. Anybody else? Anybody look for spiritual shortcuts? Well, just give me something quick and easy. Give me a microwavable revelation. You know, just give, give me some. Or, or this one, you know, go to somebody that you think is more spiritual than you and say, hey, could you give me a word? Can, can we talk about this? Let's talk about it. And so we'll go, once again, I'm not discounting the word. I'm not discounting the meme. I'm not discounting the book. I'm not <laughs> discounting the podcast. I'm not discounting that. I'm just saying, put them in their place. Supplemental to the feet of Jesus. Not in place of the feet of Jesus. So, what was I saying? <laughs> what was I saying? Help me. Martha Mary. Busyness. No, no, no. Ah! She heard the word for himself. Let's stand up. I want you to think you're getting out of here. Just stand up. So, I remember I went to this guy, super spiritual dude. You see this guy, he literally was the type of guy that when he got up to speak, a lot of people wouldn't look at him because they thought, he is just looking through my soul. No, and he did. He had an amazing gift, a super humble guy. And, and, and people, if they heard he was speaking, sometimes wouldn't go to church. If they had sinned, they just thought he would call me out. And, and I went to him. I was going through this major transition. And, you know, option A, sit at the feet of Jesus, pray, cry out to God. Or go to Herb. That was his name, Herb. And get a word. So I go up to him. I go, Herb, I need a word. Oh, sure, Robert. Grabs my hand. I'm thinking, oh, it's going to be a good word. He flings my hands down and takes a step back and says, I am not supposed to touch what God is doing. Wow. And walked away. And I'm like, oh. <laughs> it's worse than I thought. <laughs> God spoke to me and said, You and I, son, are going one on one. And he won. 
We went one on one and he won. And I'm telling you, there is no substitute for a rhema living word from God that only he can give you because only he really knows. We know in part, we prophesy in part. Jesus is spot on every time. So, you know, I, I just, I don't know how I'm going to close this. Um, raise your hands. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Oh, give us a word. Good luck. Um, now, this whole thing about, this whole thing about she's sitting at the feet of Jesus. When, when you see sitting in this culture, it's always about intimate fellowship. It's always about being relaxed, unhurried, receptive, and it's honoring. So, you know, the thing about Mary sitting at Jesus' feet, she wants, she wants to be taught. He wants to teach her. Let me just say to you who, um, I just feel like there's people right now that say, I just don't hear from God. And I'm, I'm going to say you do, but doubt has worked its way in there. Wow. Um, bow your heads, close your eyes. And um, I just want to ask a question. How many of you either have said, I don't hear God, or I don't trust what I hear. You just raise your hand. I'm just going to pray for you from here. Okay, got it, got it, got it, got it, got it. Good. Good. Just put your hand on your ear real quick. I'm just going to pray this. Father, in the name of Jesus, just thank you. Uh, this is a place where we can be humble, we can be transparent, and we know your grace is sufficient for all of our weaknesses. And so, God, for those of us that just raised our hand and responded and said, yeah, I don't know that I hear God. Your word says... Shepherds speak, sheep hear. So I pray that you would give every person ears to hear God. Um, I pray that they would match it with what your word says. It, it would never be a substitute for your word. So God, I just pray whatever the blockage is. You know, there's somebody here, you thought you heard God, you ran around and told everybody what you thought you heard and it didn't even come close. And so now it's like you said, I'm never going to do that again. And so, Father, I pray that you would arrest fear in people's lives. And I pray, God, that you would help us rather than give a list of things to facilitate this. I just pray that you would give every person in this room the grace to sit at your feet, the desire to sit at your feet. And in the practical realm, maybe it's pruning some things off the schedule. It's taking focused time to have communion, not waiting for the church service, but to get some bread, get some juice, and sit before you and receive all your goodness and sacrifice. So I do pray, God, I pray for blessings on every person here. I pray that this year would mark a new relationship with you. You said if we draw near, you would draw near. So we want to draw near. I pray that you would take away anything that gets in the way of us drawing near. Any attitude, anything, TV, whatever, God. Help us just get rid of those things and prioritize who you are. Let you be the center, God. Every day of the week. In the name of Jesus. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. I would like prayer leaders to come forward right now. Man, I tell you what, if you're going through some stuff... Or if you just want somebody to agree with you in prayer and by faith of where God is taking you in any response to anything that was said today, boy, just come up and just ask. These are great people. They love God. They love you. And let them link arms of faith with you. Church, you're dismissed. I love you. Have a great rest of the week.